All right, it's one o'clock and we can get this presentation started and others can join while we're going over some of the background information. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon um, uh, for, today's, for today's seminar entitled South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, Deepwater MPAs, Outcomes and Uncertainty from 17 Years of Sampling. The intent of the seminar series is to introduce new science and management ideas into the management realm through an open forum. South Atlantic Fishery Management Council members, uh, science and statistical uh, members, advisory panel members, as well as anyone else will have an opportunity to ask questions about the research and the findings. Before we get into the presentation, um, I want to go over a few items and also describe on how the webinar platform works. So today I'm gonna to introduce Stacy Harder shortly. She will go through her pre presentation and then we'll have a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, you can ask your questions in two different ways, one by raising your hand, and two by typing into the question box, which is located at the bottom of your control panel. To raise your hand, uh, click on the icon that looks a bit like a turkey, uh, and if it's currently green, um, that means your hand is down. When your hand is raised, it turns red. Once you raise your hand, I will recognize you um, that your hand is raised and staff will unmute you and you're gonna hear the webinar notice, you, notice notify you that you've been unmuted by the organizer. Um, then you're gonna need to unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone button if it is red. If it is green, that's indicating that you're ready to speak. As I mentioned before, the other option is to type your question into the question box. You can do this while the presentation is being given or you can hold your questions to the end. Um, if you write questions into the question box, others cannot see it, so I'll have to read it out loud for you. Um, and then um, the presenter will answer the questions. Just wanted to let everyone know that the presentation today is being recorded and will be posted to the seminar series webpage in about a week after the presentation. So getting into the introduction for Stacy. Stacy is a research ecologist with the National Marine Fisheries Service Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Uh, she's stationed in Panama City, Florida. She earned her bachelor's in biology from Florida State and master's in science uh, from the University of South Alabama, where she worked on the risk of predation impacts on growth rate. Since graduating, she's been engaged in active research in the Southeast area. Her research foc uh, focuses primarily on examining fish communities of the mesophotic reef ecosystems, particularly in and around managed and protected area. Stacy is the chair of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council's uh, System Management Plan Work Group. And this is a, a work group that helps to provide guidance on managed areas in the South Atlantic region. Her current research has, so, has shifted to focus on the NRDA Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Restoration. Um, on the mesophotic and deep benthic communities where she is a uh, project co-manager. Today, she'll be talking about 17 years of research in the South Atlantic region using remote, uh, remotely operated vehicles in and outside of the protected area. And Stacy, I will transfer it over to you. Okay, thank you, Chip. Okay, let me get into presentation mode. And can you see that okay? Yes, we are seeing it. Okay, perfect. So thanks, Chip, and thanks everybody for tuning in today. Um, I just want to take a moment to recognize my co-PIs are John Reed, Stephanie Farrington, and Andy David on this project with me. So let me move this. So the MPAs that we're going to be discussing today are the Amendment 14 MPAs, um, and this is a network of eight MPAs that span from North Carolina to the southern tip of Florida. They were implemented in 2009 as Type 2 MPAs, meaning that bottom fishing is prohibited in the protected areas, and they were intended to protect five species of deepwater grouper and two species of tilefish. So our efforts have been focused on six of these MPAs. We focused on Snowy Rack, Northern South Carolina, Edisto, Georgia, and the North Florida MPAs. 
We also started sampling the Charleston artificial deep, deep, deep reef MPA in 2016 once structures were deployed in that area. We did not target St. Lucie or the East Hump MPA. Um, logistically, it just was not possible to cover such a large area. We get a two week annual cruise and that was just too much of an area to cover. Um, however, we were able to opportunistically sample St. Lucie Hump in 2016 because bad weather pushed us that far south and that was the only place we could work. Um, and this ended up being a productive, unexpected outcome as we were able to completely map the MPA given its small size and we conducted the first visual survey of the MPA, which resulted in the first known Oculina coral mounds that had live Oculina colonies on them that's been observed south of Jeff's Reef. We also sampled East Hump MPA with John Reed and Stephanie Farrington in 2011 as part of a separate project, and that data was published in 2014. We added in sampling at the Devil's Hole um, spawning special management zone in 2013. It's right in the middle of our study area and it was designated as a spawning SMZ in 2016 and therefore is important to the council. Um, and so we also added in sampling of the Oculina HAPC and the OECA in 2015 and that was at the request of the council for updated information on that area. So even though the MPAs were not implemented until 2009, we were fortunate enough to begin surveying the areas in 2004. And we've done annual sampling through 2021 with the exception of just a few years, including 2005, 2011, and 2020. And like Chip said, our sampling approach included remotely operated vehicle dives and multi-beam mapping surveys, which I will talk about in more detail in upcoming slides. So we conducted um, opportunistic sampling north of the Snowy Wreck MPA as well when the council was considering areas for additional MPAs. And you'll see where those dives were conducted when I show a map of all of our ROV dives. We had three overall objectives for the project. We wanted to determine the abundance and distribution of economically important reef fish species and macroinvertebrates. We wanted to evaluate the habitat of the MPAs with respect to species composition and abundance, as well as geomorphology. And then we wanted to correlate the fishery and the habitat data to detect trends in fish and invertebrate populations over time. So how do we go about selecting our sites with the ROV? So having good multi beam maps is crucial. I can't state that enough. Um, and unfortunately, we did not have a lot of it in the beginning of our survey. Um, we used whatever existing multi-beam maps we could get our hands on. Um, but back in the early surveys, when very, we had very limited data, we even were using ba basic bathymetric charts. And those just really aren't very helpful at all when you're trying to plan an ROV survey. Um, as we acquired more mapping data, our sampling universe expanded each year. And we received some very valuable maps from George Sedbury in um, 2011. And then starting in 2012, when we got time on the NOAA ships, um, we were able to start acquiring our own mapping data using the ME-70 on the NOAA ship Pisces. Our sampling approach was to target the hard bottom reef habitat, as that's where most of the target species occur. And we sampled sites inside and outside the MPAs each year. The exception to this is the Georgia MPA, as that one was designed to protect tile fish on soft bottom habitat. Because we don't have any mapping from inside the MPA, we targeted the hard bottom habitat outside to the west of the MPA to assess the snapper grouper populations. Um, and because mapping data was limited, we used a combination of a typical standardized fishery independent survey, which uses random site selection with habitat strata. And we, we uh, complemented that with an effort to try to collect as much information about the MPAs that we could. And what this approach does is it lays the groundwork to be able to provide information needed to assess the effectiveness of MPAs going forward. So as I mentioned, our surveys were conducted using ROVs. For the, most of the project, we partnered with uh, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and used their Phantom II and the Mohawk ROVs, which are shown in the pictures here. The ROV dives were broken down into transects based on habitat type. And on the next slide, I'll give some more details on our habitat characterization scheme. Myself and Andy David handled the fish analysis and then John Reed and Stephanie Farrington joined the project in 2010 as co-PIs and expanded our survey to include an analysis of the macroinvertebrates. I'm gonna focus this presentation today on the fish analysis, uh, but the invertebrate analysis can also be found in our annual cruise reports that we submit to the council after each of our field efforts. 
here's the categories that we use to categorize habitats for the transects. So we looked at MPA status, either inside or outside the protected area. Depth was another factor we looked at. So these MPAs span the shelf edge and upper slope habitats from about 50 to 250 meters. And that change in depth will affect fish community composition. We also looked at relief um, and divided that into three different categories of low relief, which was zero to one meters. Moderate relief was one to three meters. And then high relief was considered anything greater than three meters. Um, another factor was rugosity, either high or low. Um, this one is somewhat subjective as there wasn't a quantitative measure used, but rugosity here is defined as a degree of ruggedness of the rock bottom. And it's relative to the size of the rock ledges, hold and, holes and crevices, which tend to provide the greatest fish habitat. So high rugosity on these shelf edge reefs occurs primarily along the edges of the ridges, where there's a zone of fractured rock slabs or zones of boulders or rock outcrops. And the low rugosity would be the flat rock pavement that is typically found at the top and the bases of the ridges. We also see some areas that have rounded rock mounds and knolls that are devoid of ledges and loose boulders, and those would also be considered low rugosity areas. And finally, substrate type. Um, so either categorized as soft substrate, pavement, low relief outcrops, moderate relief outcrops, and high relief ledge. And this is just a visual representation of the four main hard bottom habitat types. So you've got pavement in the upper left that's got no relief to it. You've got low relief outcrops on the upper right, moderate relief outcrops on the bottom left and high relief ledge on the bottom right. So for the fish analysis, as I mentioned previously, the ROV dives were broken down into transects based on habitat type. So this is an example of a map that shows multi-beam data from the Edisto MPA. And the line on the map represents our ROV dive. And then the different colors represent the different habitat types and therefore transects along that dive. So we identified and counted all of the fish for each transect. And then we calculated transect area by multiplying the transect width by the transect length. So transect width was estimated using lasers that were on the ROV that are a known distance apart. And then transect length was calculated from the ROV tracking. And then we use that to calculate fish densities as the number per 1,000 meters square for each transect. The next couple of slides show the multi-beam mapping that we have accomplished since 2012. So this shows the northern portion of our study area, basically from the deep artificial MPA extending north of the snowy wreck MPA. And then this map shows the multi-beam mapping that we've conducted in the southern portion of the study from the Georgia MPA south to St. Lucie. A total of 1320 kilometers squared of new multi-beam has been collected from the study between 2012 and 2021. And then this map shows all of our ROV dives. We've completed 342 dives between 2004 and 2021 in depths of 30 to 264 meters. And the average length of our dives is approximately one kilometer. So essentially we've visually represented 342 kilometers of area over the years. And then here's a breakdown of our dives showing how many were conducted inside and outside each MPI. And the list goes from north on the top to south on the bottom. So you can see most of our effort has focused on the Northern South Carolina, Edisto, and North Florida MPAs. We didn't start sampling the barges until 2016 after material was deployed in those MPAs. And then as I mentioned, St. Lucie's hump was only surveyed one year and that was because bad weather pushed us that far south. The Oculina is separated out into the OHAPC and the OECA. Um, this has been a very difficult area to work in um, because of the Gulf Stream. We get currents up to uh, as high as four knots. Um, so we were actually only able to dive inside the OECA one year in 2016. And we've been able to do a little bit more um, in the OHAPC because it's usually a little bit more to the west and just slightly outside of the, the Gulf Stream. And then, as I mentioned previously, our dives at Georgia have only been conducted outside the MPA on the hard bottom due to the lack of mapping inside the MPA. So while mapping and imagery from the ROV have been the focus of our data collection, we've also acquired CTD data 
as well as physical samples over the years as well. Um, we've usually had a C seabird CTD attached to the ROV for most dives. At a minimum, it's collected temperature and depth, um, but a few years ago, we got an upgraded model and we've been able to track several other metrics, including conductivity, pressure, salinity, sound velocity, density, oxygen saturation, and nitrogen saturation. And I know this graph is probably small for you and hard to read, but basically this is the type of information that we get from the CTD. Typically salinity is fairly constant with depth, and there's usually a, but there's usually a strong thermal climb. And temperature in particular has helped us identify when an upwelling event may be occurring because um, it strongly affects the visibility on the bottom and therefore the behavior and the detection ability of the fish. Also with the upgrade in the ROV in 2014, we gained, we gained sampling capabilities. And so a total of 127 invertebrates, mostly sponges and corals, have been collected for various purposes. The majority of our samples were collected for taxonomy purpose, um, as it's often difficult to identify the invertebrates from imagery alone. But we've also made a number of collections for DNA and chemical analysis, and we've also made collections of live invertebrates, including some for the Smithsonian, as well as live corals for the uh, NERDA, Mesophotic, and Deep Bentha Community Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Restoration Project. And this project is trying to learn more about the biology of the corals um, to eventually be able to propagate them for restoration purposes. So now I'm going to move into some of the results from this project by discussing three manuscripts that have come from this survey. So the first manuscript I'll be talking about was published in 2016 and was titled No Evidence of Increased Demersal Fish Abundance Six Years After Creation of MPAs in the South Atlantic. Um, this is a collaboration with research colleagues at the NOAA Beaufort Lab as well as Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. So the data that went into this analysis was human-occupied vehicle surveys conducted between 2001 and 2004, as well as our ROV survey um, using data from 2004 to 2014. And the depth range we looked at was 45 to 125 meters, so it didn't include some of the data from the deeper portions of our MPAs. And the MPAs that we focused on were the Snowy Wreck MPA, the Northern South Carolina MPA, Edisto, Georgia, and North Florida MPAs. And the objective was to determine if changes could be detected in density or number of reef fish species inside versus outside the MPAs. And we used a combination of univaria and multivaria analysis to look at this. So this table shows the percent frequency of occurrence of six different grouper species for each year. And then the numbers inside the parentheses represent the total number of individuals observed. The bottom row represents a total percent and numbers for all the years. Um, and the point that I wanted to show is just that the percent frequency of occurrence of most of the grouper species was generally low, with the exception of scamp, which we observed on 48% of the transects. And the lowest percent frequency of occurrence was observed for Warsaw grouper and Snowy grouper. And as a little aside, one thing I'd like to point out at this point is that this manuscript did not include the deeper depths of any of the MPAs, but in particular, the Northern South Carolina MPA. Um, because, and I bring up that MPA in particular because inside and outside the deeper depths of this MPA are old iceberg scars. And so when the icebergs were moving through the area, it pushed all the rocks and the boulders to the sides of the scars and created this great habitat for some of the target species. So we have looked at this area over the years, even though it wasn't included in this analysis. Um, and these areas have demonstrated higher densities of both snowy grouper and blue line tilefish compared to the shallower portions of the MPAs. Okay, so I know this is a lot of data on the slide and it's probably pretty small for you, but I will go over the highlights of the results from this study. Um, for the univaria analysis, we used generalized additive models or GAMs to directly test for a difference in three response variables between samples collected inside and outside the MPAs. So GAMs are a non-parametric regression modeling approach that can fit lint fit nonlinear relationships between responses and predict variables. And a major benefit of GAMS is their ability to fit a variety of distributions to underlying random variation. So we use GAMS because they can more accurately quantify an MPA effect after standardizing for many of the variables that influence patterns in demersal fish abundance and distribution. 
The three response variables that we looked at were the total number of fish species, the density of exploited fish species, and the density of vermilion snapper. So vermilions were called out because they have a relatively short lifespan and an early maturity, so we would expect them to respond quicker to management measures. And they were also observed relatively frequently um, on our surveys. And this is what the top left set of graphs show. Um, each graph shows one of the predictor variables. So the top one is the number of species, the middle is the number of fish species, and the bottom shows the density of the vermilion snapper. And along the x-axis is year. Um, the black dots and lines represent data from outside the MPAs, and the gray points and line represent data from inside the MPAs. Dashed lines represent the 95% confidence intervals. So if there was a difference between inside and outside the MPAs, you would expect that the yearly trends of the inside versus outside to diverge after the MPA was created in 2009, which is what this vertical line in all of the graphs represents. We did not see that for any of the predictor variables. So one downside to this is that it, it looked at all the MPAs together, it lumped them all together. So, but there may be effects that are occurring on a smaller scale. So we decided to look at the two most heavily sampled MPAs, which would be Edisto and North Florida MPAs, and we looked at them separately. Uh, we weren't able to use GAMS in this case due to sample size limitations. So we examined the mean values of the three response variables. And that is what the top right set of graph re represents. The column of graphs on the left is the Edisto MPA, and the column of graphs on the right is the North Florida MPA. Again, each of the response variables are on the y-axis and year is along the x-axis. The open circles represent outside MPA and the closed circles represent inside the MPA. And we saw similar results for these analysis as well with the mean values inside and outside each MPA tracking very closely together rather than diverging. And then for the multivariate analysis, we used non-metric multidimensional scaling or MDS and analysis of similarity. And these analyses were used to compare fish community densities based on a before, after, control, impact, or BACI design at two different spatial scales. So we looked at the overall survey area, and then we looked separately at Edisto and the North Florida MPAs, just like we did for the univariate analysis. And the graphs on the bottom um, show these MDS plots at these spatial scales. And again, there did not appear to be an observable change in community structure occurring inside the MPAs that was not also occurring outside the MPAs, both when you were looking at the entire study area as well as just the Edisto MPA. Now, the North Florida MPA was a little bit different um, in that sites outside the MPAs appeared to change over time, whereas those inside did not. However, um, the statistics were low for this, so that suggests that the differences may not have been biologically significant. Okay, so what are some potential reasons for why we didn't see an MPA effect? And there's, there's several different things that could be going on. Um, the first is a lack of statistical power due to low sample size. And this goes back to when I was discussing our sampling approach because we had limited mapping data to begin with um, and we were constantly adding and expanding our sampling universe. We were forced into the sampling approach that we used. Um, and now that we have greatly expanded our mapping coverage of the MPAs, Incorporating some fixed sites into the sampling design would really help minimize the variability that appears to be diluting the interannual signals. Secondly, um, because the manuscript only used data through 2014, um, which is six years post-closure, um, it is conceivable that collection of the data was not long enough post-closure to detect an effect. Um, longer lived and slower growing species, like a lot of the demersal fish in the South Atlantic, can be expected to take longer to respond. However, given that vermilion snapper live to 13 years and are 100% mature at age two, we would have expected them to respond um, during the study and they did not. The third reason could be that shape, size, placement of the MPAs may not be optimal given the biology and ecology of the focal species and the orientation of the shelf edge reef system relative to that of the MPAs is not ideal. A fourth potential reason is that not enough area is protected from fishing. Um, there's recommendations out there that suggest that at least 20% of the managed area needs to be protected because these larger areas allow more species to be able to complete their complete life cycles within the protected boundaries. And then the last two potential reasons deal with fishing activity along the boundaries and compliance rates. 
So some reef features inside the MPAs are very close to the, the boundaries. Um, if this increases fishing along the boundaries, it could draw fish outside the MPA. And I think we all know that there has to be a high compliance rate in order for an MPA effect to be able to be detected. Okay, the second manuscript I'll be discussing was published earlier this year and it's titled Reef Fish Community Structure Along the Southeast Atlantic Continental Shelf Break and Upper Slope Appears Resistant to Increasing Lionfish. This was a collaboration with the same people and used the same data as the previous manuscript I was just discussing, except that it was published later, so we were able to use data through 2019 instead of 2014. Depth range was the same, 45 to 125 meters. And the objective of this study was to examine whether lionfish influenced reef fish community structure. So we had threefold. We wanted to look at how changes in lionfish density changed over time. We wanted to characterize the fish communities along the shelf break and upper slope. And then we wanted to determine if fish community structure was affected by increasing lionfish densities. And again, a combination of univariate and multivariate analysis was used to look at this. So for a few results, the graphs on the left show the change in lionfish densities over time. The top graph shows the percent of transects in which lionfish were observed, and the bottom graph shows standardized lionfish density over time. Both of these graphs show the drastic increase in lionfish densities over time, essentially increasing from a density of zero in 2001 to about an average of 1.25 lionfish, lionfish per 100 meter cubed in 2019. And then the graphs to the right show the effect of different predictor variables on lionfish densities. So the top graph shows a strong relationship between a standardized lionfish density and habitat type, with density being almost twice as high on high relief ledge transects compared to pavement. The next graph down shows that standardized lionfish density also varied across latitudes. It was the lowest in the southern portion of the study area and then got higher in Georgia, South Carolina, and especially North Carolina. The third graph down shows standardized lionfish density was negatively related to depth with density an order of magnitude greater at depths of 45 to 50 meters compared to a depth of 125 meters. And then the bottom graph shows lionfish density was positively related to bottom water temperature up to about 20 degrees C, at which point density appeared either invariant or negatively related to temperature. And this shows the results of our univariate analysis. Um, these were again conducted with GANs um, because it was important for us to standardize transect densities of lionfish by predictor variables that might influence their density. So to determine whether lionfish had a measurable influence on the reef fish community, we evaluated the sign and the significance of lionfish density predictor variables in five different univariate GAMs. Each one of the graphs here, shown here represents the effects of one of these response variables on lionfish densities. So increasing lionfish densities is shown on the x-axis and the y-axis is the predictor variable. So the top graph shows species richness, the second one down shows Shannon diversity. The middle one is the number of small demersal species. The next one down is the number of individuals of fishery targeted species. And then finally, we looked at the number of individuals of non-fishery targeted species on the bottom. So if lionfish influence the native fish community, we would expect to observe significant negative relationships between the fish community metrics and lionfish densities. Instead, the five univariate response variables describing the fish community were either positively related or unrelated to increasing lionfish densities. So what are some reasons why we didn't detect a difference um, with the lionfish? So first, um, the influence of lionfish on reef fish may be dependent on the spatial scale of the observation. So most previous studies that examined lionfish effects on prey species were on pretty small spatial scales, less than 30 kilometers squared. Whereas our study tested for the influence of lionfish at a much broader spatial scale on the order of hundreds of kilometers. And generally predation effects on prey are stronger at small spatial scales compared to large. So therefore it's possible that lionfish reduce prey densities more strongly at small spatial scales, but more weakly at large spatial scales. Secondly, our study focused on the continental shelf break and the upper slope habitats. And there's evidence that suggests that lionfish may be more common in the shallower depths. 
Therefore, lionfish may be having a stronger impact in those shallower areas compared to the deeper habitats that we examined in our study. A third potential explanation is that lionfish densities may not have increased enough in the region to significantly influence the fish community structure. Um, there's been other studies that have demonstrated lionfish densities can get much higher than what we observed in this study, and studies suggest that lionfish densities must be relatively high to elicit a negative response on native species. And then finally, um, our analysis did not seem to appear to lack statistical power for this manuscript because our confidence intervals for the univariate analyses were relatively narrow, but because you can't um, determine statistical power after a study is complete, it's impossible to rule out that low statistical power could have been um, influenced the findings. Okay, and then the third manuscript I'm going to talk about is was published in 2020 and was titled Four Decades of Re Observations Illuminate Deep, group, Deep Water Grouper Hotspots. And this was a collaboration with researchers at the BOA, at the Beaufort NOAA Lab, um, UNCW, and NC State University. So the objective here was to synthesize direct observations of large-bodied groupers on deep artificial and natural reefs and determine where the aggregations exist, how the grouper counts compare at aggregation reefs compared to elsewhere, and then what characteristics are unique about the aggregation sites. So the data for this study ranged from 1979 to 2019 in depths of 50 to 300 meters. It consisted of 235 HOV transects, 439 ROV transects, including many from our survey, as well as 881 hook and line drops. Now the hook and line drops are not comparable to the transects from the HOV and the ROV, so they weren't used uh, when we were in comparing the two, but they provided additional data on sites with and without high grouper catches. So this map shows all of the transects that were included in our analysis and the six grouper hotspots that we identified, five of them which were artificial reefs and one was a natural reef. Um, so the gray circles represent natural reefs that were not a hotspot. The red circle represents a natural reef that was identified as a hotspot, and the red triangles are the artificial reefs that were also hotspots. And three of the artificial reefs that were hotspots were data collected from our ROV survey, and these were the snowy wreck, deep barge, and shallow barge. So the deep barge and the shallow barge just refer to the two barges that were originally sunk inside the Charleston Deep Artificial MPA. <clears throat> they didn't come with names, so we just named them uh, shallow and deep because one was sunk in 85 meters of water and the other one was sunk in 100 meters of water. And so for all the hotspots areas, the grouper counts exceeded the grouper counts outside the hotspots areas by many orders of magnitude. So first, I want to take a closer look at the three artificial reef um, hotspots that resulted from our ROV survey. And the first one is snowy wreck. So the graph on the left shows the average grouper count per linear meter for the snowy wreck hotspot over the years. And then on the right is the mean grouper count outside of the hotspots. Um, and this one is separated by shelf edge, which is the darker columns and upper slope depths, which are the lighter columns. And the data um, for outside of the hotspots is also separated by data set. Um, the three main data sets that went into this were the CFIS data set on the left, um, a Sedbury data set in the middle, and then our ROV survey here on the right. So you have to really look at the scale on the y-axis to see the drastic difference in grouper counts between the two. At the Snowy Wreck hotspot, the average grouper counts were about less than one per meter in 2004, before the MPAs were implemented. And then the average grouper count went up to about 2.5 per linear meter in 2012 and continued to increase to about 5.5 grouper per linear meter in 2016. It then slightly decreased to um, four grouper per meter in 2017. If you look at that in contrast to the highest mean grouper counts per meter observed outside of the hotspots, it was only 0 0.02, so huge difference. And I now have a video, short video clip um, of the snowy wreck that was taken in 2012. Um, I wanted you to get an idea of the number and the size of snowy grouper that we see on this wreck. So for this year, this was taken in 2012, so the average grouper count was about 2.5 2 per meter, 
Um, and keep in mind that this average more than doubled in 2016. Um, unfortunately, this video was taken at the Snowy Wreck as well, but this was our last time out there in 2021 and showed fishing activity occurring on the wreck. So when we first came up on these guys, they weren't moving. We didn't know they were alive, but we hung out here for a little while. We repositioned the ROV to get some good footage. Um, and all of a sudden they started moving, which was very eerie. Um, we also observed other fishing line gear on the wreck, as well as another snowy grouper that was swimming around with a mouth with a hook in its mouth and some line trailing from it. So we're still working on analyzing these dives, um, but we did notice a decrease in the snowy grouper abundance on the wreck last year. Um, and so hopefully we'll have the, those specific numbers soon. Okay, moving on to the barges of the Charleston Deep Artificial Reef MPA. The graph on the left shows mean grouper counts per linear meter for the barge's hotspot. Um, and it's separated out by the shallow barge and the deep barge. And that's compared to the mean grouper count outside of the hotspots, which is on the right. And that's the same graph that you saw shown with the, for the snowy wreck comparison. So again, the mean, the highest mean grouper count outside of the hotspots was only 0.02. Whereas when you look at the grouper counts on the barges, they range from about 0.1 to 0.35 grouper per meter. Um, and these graphs also show a breakdown of the grouper species observed at each barge, which I'm gonna talk about more in subsequent slides when I show you some videos of the barges. And this one is the shallow barge. Again, it's just the name we gave it because it, it was sunk in uh, 85 meters of water. Um, some of the economically important species we've observed here are scamp, gag, like you're seeing in the video here, red snapper, gray snapper, amberjack, um, and we even observed a juvenile speckled hind on it last year. This video um, is up on the top of the barge, um, and like I said, as you can see, there's gag, yeah, there's another one in the back there, and it also shows red snapper and amberjack in it as well. Okay, this one is the deep barge. Um, again, just our name for it. It was, it's in 100 meters of water. Um, the deeper depths of this barge do influence the fish composition. Uh, while we still see scamp and red snapper like we do on the shallow barge, uh, we also see more snowy grouper, yellow edge grouper, and Warsaw on the deeper one. Um, and we even observed a juvenile misty grouper on it in the past. So this video is also on top of the barge. Um, and you can see amberjack, red snapper, and then there's about like four or five scamp in the background. Um, this video clip is what we call the new barge, which also sits in about 100 meters of water. Um, this one was not part of the analysis for the manuscript, but I wanted to show you what it looked like. Um, this is the newest material that was sunk by the South Carolina DNR, um, and I believe they refer to it as the swing bridge. So this video doesn't really show a whole lot of fish, um, that we observed, because a lot of them we observed were hanging out at the base of the structure, but I thought it gave a really good overview of what the what it looks like on the bottom. And so some of the economically important species we've seen here are snowy grouper, amberjack, and a juvenile misty grouper. And I wanna note that the only place we've ever observed misty grouper over the 17 years of the survey um, has been on these artificial structures. Okay, so what is different about these hotspots? Well, all six of them are isolated, deeper habitats. In fact, all of the habitats we examined with these characteristics supported grouper aggregations. So these are small, per, small patches of either natural or artificial reefs, and they're surrounded by large expanses of sandy, unconsolidated, and unstructured habitat. Five of the six were artificial reefs, um, but because artificial habitats are inherently small and isolated, we don't know whether habitat isolation or reef type is a better predictor. Um, and this outcome of the study was extremely intriguing to all of us authors, um, and it really just introduced more research questions that we want to answer um, if we're given the availability of funding. You know, for instance, how do these small structures support such a large biomass of fish and what attracts them to these areas? And how do these aggregations relate to the larger scale dynamics of these populations? Okay, I'm stepping away from the manuscripts now, and there's a couple of areas that are of interest to the council that I wanted to give some updated information on. 
Um, the first one is Oculina. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the council requested that we survey this area beginning in 2015. It is a bear of an area to work in given the Gulf Stream current. Um, but over the years, we were able to complete 17 dives. Four of them were in the OECA, um, which is the smaller portion down here on the map. And then the rest of it is the OHAPC. And the graphs show the abundance of fish species observed in the OECA on the top and then on the, in the OHAPC on the bottom. So the most abundant fish seen in the OACA were things like wrasses, tattler, yellowtail reefish, and vermilion snapper. Um, and then some of the economically important species that we observed here were vermilion snapper, greater amberjack, red snapper, scamp, gag grouper, and warsaw grouper. The most abundant species inside the OHAPC were quite similar to the OECA and included things like tattler and bank butterfly fish and short big eye and scorpion fish. And then the economically important species observed here were red snapper, amberjack, snowy grouper, scamp, grape triggerfish, and gag grouper. Um, our survey also demonstrated the first large school of red snapper inside the OECA as well as the first Warsaw grouper sighting in the OHAPC that has been observed since the 1990s. Um, and then John Reed and Stephanie Farrington did an analysis of the corals and highlights from that analysis include um, evidence of scattered live oculina colonies are starting to regrow in the OHAPC and the OECA. In 2016 alone, 333 colonies of live oculina were counted across three dives in the OHAPC and four dives in the OECA. Um, of those, 154 were in the OHAPC and 179 were in the OECA. And then the last place I wanna give a bit of information on is this Devil's Hole SMZ, which was designated in 2016, um, but we began surveying it in 2013. So we've conducted 11 dives over the years in this area, and that's what this map on the left shows. Um, the, the SMZ is mapped in its entirety, and you can see where those dives were located. Um, we observed very large schools of fish on some of these dives. Um, so surprisingly, they were, not the, they were the most common species observed, um, and that's what this top table shows. So these schools consisted of antheas, which are small sea basses, um, primarily red barbiers. We also saw schools of scad, vermilion snapper, tomtates, and striped grunt. The abundance of the non-schooling species um, is shown on the graph on the bottom. And some of the most abundant species included things like cubbyu, big eye, squirrel fish, puffers, wrasses, and damselfish. And then some of the economically important species that we saw there were greater and Elmaco amberjack, scamp, snowy grouper, porgies, gray snapper, gray triggerfish, red snapper, blackfin snapper, marbled grouper, and gag grouper. And then I've got a video of this area as well. Um, so you can see what the habitat and the fish populations look like here. Um, so this video shows some really nice high relief, high rugosity habitat. Um, there's a blackfin snapper there, a scamp grouper. And then these schools here are mostly, um, the small ones are antheids, those small sea basses, and then the larger ones are schools of tomtates. But this has been a very cool area to work in and we've gotten some really good dives. Um, and yeah, as you can see, these videos take a long time to read for the fish analysis because there's a ton of schools there. Okay, uh, so summarize, sum in summary, um, we were unable to detect a statistically significant MPA effect for the natural hard bottom MPAs. And I believe that this, this could possibly be due to the sampling methodology that we were limited to. Because we started with very limited mapping data and we were constantly trying to expand our sampling universe, we were never able to really employ a strict random sam stratified sampling design. Um, and we have funding for usually two weeks each year to be out on the water and we cover an area from North Carolina down to mid Florida. So that means we really only spend about two days at each of the MPAs, which just leads to small sample sizes. Um, also given the rarity of a lot of these grouper species, the amount of sampling that may be necessary to achieve a higher statistical power may be enormous and we just don't know. Um, however, the artificial reefs within, within the MPAs have proven to be a hotspot for grouper aggregations. Um, and this survey has been the only MPA-focused data collection effort 
and we've provided the council with an enormous amount of information over the last 17 years on the MPAs, and we've been providing South Carolina DNR with valuable information on the barges since they were sunk um, since about 2016. Um, and I'll just end with, unfortunately, funding priorities for NOAA's Con Coral Reef Conservation Program um, have changed. And so as of right now, this survey is no longer being funded as of last year. So I'm going to end there and I guess I will take questions. All right. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. And I will take back uh, control from you. All right, and once again, how to work the webinar. Um, you can click on the microphone. It's currently red for everyone right now, indicating that you're muted by yourself, uh, potentially by yourself as well as the organizer. Um, once I unmute you, um, you'll hear a notification that you've been unmuted by the organizer. If it remains red, unmute yourself till it turns green. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, click on this icon here. Uh, right now it should be green for most everyone. I don't see any hands up right now. When it turns red, that's indicating that your hand is raised. And then finally, if you'd like to ask a question, you can type it in the question box and I will read the question aloud for you. So with that, um, please ask any questions that you like. Um, let's have an open discussion about what they found in the uh, these areas offshore, the marine protected areas. All right, Judd, I see you have your hand up. Oops, yeah. there you go. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, thanks, that was a great presentation. Um, I was looking on your on one of your gams you had for the linefish, you were able to model like the latitudinal change. And I guess that was for um, across all years, but I was curious to see if you had, you know, this the spatial resolution over time to see if that, if there had been more of a latitudinal shift or a range expansion in the linefish and in any other species as well. Um, so for the latitudinal studies, we were just looking at lionfish there. So we didn't look at, um, at other species as well. Um, and no, we just looked, we looked at it for all years combined is how we did that analysis. Just looking for those predictive variables that were um, affecting lionfish densities or could potentially affect lionfish densities. All right, Chester, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I do. Thank you for the presentation. I. Oh, my question just went out of my head. Let me clear my head for a second. All, it, it seems as though all of the <coughs> studies that you've been doing are with the inside MPAs or outside, particularly when it comes to the artificial reefs or the reefs, or excuse me, the artificial reefs. Um, are you aware of any studies that relate to artificial reefs that are not inside of MPAs? And, my specific reason for asking that is uh, we've got a Homage County, uh, we've got a pretty good program going where we have uh, been sinking a lot of FPL concrete poles. And we seem to have had a tremendous, tremendous uh, increase in the number of fish that are on what previously were barren bottoms. Uh, but that is, those are not in, in an MPA. They are uh, protected in a sense by the good old Gulf Stream because they're deep enough that they're almost impossible to fish and they're also deep enough so that they are very difficult to dive. And like I said, we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of fishes, fish uh, on those things. Thank you. I'll mute myself. That's great, and thanks for that question. Um, actually, I'm glad you asked that because two two of the reefs that I did not go into any detail on that were considered hot spots for grouper were not in MPAs, and their areas farther north in North Carolina um, at SS Butte Bluefields and U576 areas is what they're called. Um, so those two were also identified as grouper hotspots in our manuscript. 
but the, they are not within a protected area. All right, any other questions? Christina? Sure, I don't mean to take us off track a little bit. I know this is sort of outside of what you've just presented here, but given that you talked a little bit about, you know, non-compliance um, maybe causing some issues with the effectiveness of these MPAs, do you know if there's any, any attempt to sort of collect more you know, social justice, social equity, or economic information that's looking a bit more at the process of how these MPAs are set up or how fishermen have sort of altered their behavior or perceptions of these MPAs just to sort of get it why we might be having some issues with compliance. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I think that's something that would be very valuable to, to do. Um, that I think that's actually that question might be more related to the council rather than myself. Um, I don't think that's something that we would conduct, but um, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, and I, I can say we haven't, at least I'm not aware of studies that do that, Christina. John Hadley. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. It's kind of alluded to there in the first and second bullets. Um, in the presentation, it seemed like the first and third publication are, are somewhat at odds with one another, um, where, you know, in the first one, it's saying that there's not necessarily an MPA effect um, looking at multiple MPAs, but then it seems like there are uh, hotspots for groupers and some aggregations on artificial reefs. Um, do you have any idea what you may be able to attribute that to? Um, is it maybe uh, different kind of reef structures and um, kind of getting at, are there certain kinds of uh, structure that should, that should or could be protected in the future? Say, you know, maybe look at protecting or uh, creating artificial reefs within MPAs versus focusing on natural hard bottom. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, so the, the the first manuscript where we weren't able to detect effect, an effect um, was looking at the natural hard bottom MPAs, and then the third manuscript focusing just on um, well on a natural and artificial. Um, but I do want to reiterate the point that it was just it wasn't just looking at um, artificial structures within MPAs. We also did find hot spots that are outside the MPAs as well. Um, and so even though five of those six group of hot spots were on artificial reefs, we, we don't know whether, because artificial reefs are inherently small isolated structures. Um, so we don't know if it's actually that or, um, you know, if it's the habitat type or the reef type itself that, that they're attracted to at this point. So that's kind of one of those research questions that came from the study that we'd love to be able to look further into in the future. All right, there was a question written online. Uh, with the minimal difference uh, between MPAs and open areas, why continue the MPAs? Perhaps if more law enforcement was employed, there would be a result, uh, that would result in a difference. Yeah, good question. Um, so there is a difference between the fact that we did not detect a difference versus there actually not being a difference. Um, and at this point, we don't know which one of those it is, but our study was not able to detect a difference. Um, and like I said, this may be because we lack statistical robustness in our sampling approach. Um, so I, I feel like now that we're at the point where we have collected enough mapping, you know, we could employ a statistically sound, um, randomized stratified survey going forward um, to really get that robustness to look at whether um, there may be an MPA effect or not. But just because we didn't detect one doesn't mean there's necessarily not one at this point. We just can't, we just can't say, we don't know at this point. 
Okay, Amy, I see you have your hand raised. Thanks, Chip. Hey, Stacy, it's Amy Dukes with SCDNR. Great presentation. Thank you so much for highlighting the last 17 years of your efforts. Um, your answer just sort of sparked what I was already going to talk about. Yes, you could not detect a significant difference. So, unfortunately, with your funding priority shortcoming, how would you see moving forward? How can state partners, how could potential council funds help sort of propel this back? You, you guys need to be able to continue this effort, maybe after a year hiatus, of course, but I'm just wondering what we can do to help make sure that we get these ROV footages moving forward, especially knowing we're continuing to put additional material in the Charleston debrief, the largest of which will be deployed hopefully later this month. That's great. And we have thoroughly enjoyed looking at the barge MPAs. They've always been a very cool ROV dive that we all look very much forward to. Um, so as far as the funding issue goes, so this was um, most of our funding came from NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program that was routed through the South Atlantic Council. Um, so we are looking into possibly getting some money from our center, from the Southeast Fishery Science Center, to continue this study, maybe on a limited basis um, from here on out, but we don't have any guarantee that that's gonna happen at this point. Um, if we, I don't know, Amy, I would, I would love to discuss possibilities of doing something, partnering with the state, um, especially to look at those barges and new material that's put down um, and to be able to look at changes over time in that area. Um, so yeah, if you, I, I'd love to discuss more with you offline if, if, if interested. Absolutely. Um, and so most of the funding that DNR has able um, to provide has actually all been done through private donations, done through the South Carolina um, Governor's Cut Bill Fishing Series and our Memorial Reef, which has pretty much all been private funds. And, and we're happy to maybe even support some of that ROV footage if it's designated in that area to be able to, to help push this forward. So conversations offline would be great. That sounds good. That sounds great. All right, Judd, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chip. Yeah, I was just curious on that first bullet as well, um, just the, the detection of a statistically significant effect. And um, I was just kind of thinking about like, you know, in MPA theory, you have the spillover effect, right? That's kind of one of the benefits of it. And then you know, your abundance, your biomass spills over into those outlying areas. I mean, how far away from the MPAs was your non-MPA sampling site? Do you think it was far enough away where then um, it's an, and is it an equivalent habitat as well? So I'm just kind of like curious on that sampling design. And maybe that could be a reason why you didn't see an effect. Yeah, so our sites outside, we definitely correlated the habitat type. So we made sure we were making comparisons between um, the same type of habitat in, inside versus outside. Um, and I would say, I mean, some of them are relatively close to the boundary, but I would say there were other sites that were outside that were maybe, I don't know, five kilometers away or something like that. Um, so that's probably about the range of distance that we were looking at. So I'm, I'm just curious if you've updated your analysis from the first paper at all to see if um, additional time, has there been an effect for any of the species by chance? We have not done that and that's a great idea. Um, we're still working on analyzing the 2021 data at this point. Um, and so since we don't have the funding to go back out at this point on the water, um, if given, given time and, and everything, I think that would be a great idea if we could update that analysis. All right, any other questions? Well, I am not seeing any hands raised. So thank you so much for your time today, Stacy. That was a great presentation. 
Um, once again, this presentation will be posted onto the seminar series webpage. Uh, so if some, if you want to pass it along to others, it should be up there in about a week. Um, and I can also send a presentation out to the group. Um, and for our next presentation, which is going to be, um, let me check the date to make sure. I believe it's May 10th. Yes, it will be May 10th. And we're going to be talking about um, Pacific management of there are ground fish species, which is mainly looking at rockfish. Um, so we're going to be talking about that and how they manage those species over on the West Coast. Thank, thank everyone for their time today. We really appreciate this uh, discussion, and we look forward to seeing you at our next presentation. Take care. <laughs>